Okay, so welcome to today's installment of the uh, Ringvorlesung. So the topic today is Nullstellensätze. That's the plural of the singular uh, noun der Nullstellensatz, which means a theorem of zeros or theorem about zeros. I'll tell you about some theorems about zeros of certain equations. And we're going to be interested in certificates for infeasibility. So for the first part, the setting is that K is an algebraically closed field. And we're working in the polynomial ring in n variables over k, n variables x1 up to xn. And we're given an ideal and the corresponding variety, zero set of this ideal in k to the n. So we have an ideal in a polynomial ring in n variables over an algebraic closed field, the variety being all the zeros. So the first theorem is the following. So suppose I is a proper ideal. So if I is a proper ideal, then the variety is non-zero. Okay? So if I is a proper ideal in the polynomial ring, such an ideal actually has to have a zero over an algebraically closed field. Now you can read the contrapositive. The contrapositive says if the variety is the empty set, if our equations have no solution, then the ideal is the whole ring, or equivalently, one is in the ideal. Right? So this is equivalent to saying as soon as a system of polynomial equations does not have a solution, there's a partition of unity. You can write one as a polynomial linear combination of the generators. So I'd like to give you the proof. So the proof is by induction on the number of variables, n. Now in one variable, the base case, the situation is very simple. So in one variable, every ideal has a single generator, polynomial ring in one variable is a principal ideal domain. And uh, we're assuming that this ideal is proper, so therefore, F, the principal generator, is a univariate polynomial of positive degree. Now, such a polynomial has to have a zero. Has a zero in K, well, that's the definition of algebraically closed field, right? So a field is algebraically closed, means that every polynomial in one variable has a zero if it has positive degree, and this shows the claim for n equals 1. So now let's look at uh, the induction step. So we have two or more variables, so n is at least 2. And we're going to prove the following claim towards the theorem. The claim is there exists some field element, some scalar a, such that 1, the constant 1, is not in the ideal that we obtain by specializing the last variable to A. So I take my ideal, I look at all polynomial in the ideal, I replace the last variable xn by A. This gives us an ideal in the polynomial ring in n minus 1 variables. And uh, the claim is, as a polynomial ideal in n minus 1 variables, x1 up to xn minus 1, this ideal is not the whole ring. It doesn't contain the one element, okay? That's, that is the claim, and this will then, once we have this, we will from this be able to deduce the, uh, the assertion by induction on n. So let's prove the claim. There's gonna be two cases that we distinguish. The first case is that the elimination ideal, so we're intersecting i, just with the polynomial ring in one variable, the last variable xn, that this is not the zero ideal. So case one is this is not a zero ideal, and case two will be this is the zero ideal. Okay? So let's assume that this is not the zero ideal. 
Well, since one is not an I, this was our hypothesis, it's also not in there, so one is not in this ideal. Um, since one is not in the ideal, this is now an ideal in a polynomial ring in one variable, and this is generated by a polynomial, a non-constant polynomial, And this non-constant polynomial, I'm gonna write in factored form. So we're over an algebraically closed field. So i from one up to r. So the roots are b i, where i is from one up to r. And then m i, let me call this polynomial f. So there's a non-constant polynomial written like this in factored form that generates our principal elimination ideal. Now, Suppose that one is in the ideal that we get by specializing i. So xn gets specialized to bi for i, one, two, up to r. So we look at these roots of our polynomial and we look at the various specializations and I claim that we can assume that all of them, all of these ideals in a polynomial ring in n minus one variable, that they will all gen uh, contain the element one. Well, otherwise we're done. Again, all right, so otherwise we are done, right? Because if one is not in the ideal, then we've established the claim, right? The goal right now is to prove the claim, so. So we can assume now that uh, all of these contain one. Now, what does this mean? This means <clears throat> there exist polynomials B1 up to BR, capital B1 up to BR, all in the ideal I with the property that BI, so I look at, keep the first N minus one variables as variables, but then I have substitute in bi, and that's actually one, right? So this is a representation, so if you unravel this, one is in the ideal, means there exists something in capital I, and then if I further specialize xn to be bi, then this is actually the one polynomial. The proof I'm presenting here is the proof that you can find in Cox O'Shea's book. Okay, now we can rewrite this. So this is essentially equivalent to saying that bi is congruent to one modulo the ideal xi, I'm sorry, xn minus bi, right? So there are polynomials b1, b2, and so on in the ideal that have the additional property that these bi, that bi is congruent to one modulo this ideal xn minus bi, okay? Now from this, I claim we can conclude that b1 to the m1, b2 to the m2 up to br to the mr, so we're gathering the exponents from here that this product is in fact also congruent to one. Now modulo f. Right? So f is the product of these things. So I claim I can multiply these congruences, and that's the Chinese remainder theorem, right? So if in a, for example, in the integers, if something is congruent to one mod seven, it's also congruent to one mod eight, then you know the product, the products will be congruent to one mod 56. Okay, so this is the Chinese remainder theorem. And but now we're done. So this, I claim, means hopefully that one is in the ideal um, because f is in the ideal, right? So the b's are in the ideal, so therefore this product is in the ideal, f is in the ideal, so I've shown that one is in the ideal, okay? So I've derived the, uh, the claim under the hypothesis that the uh, case one, that this principal elimination ideal is not the zero ideal. 
Let's do case two. <clears throat> so case two is that it is the zero ideal. So here we're gonna use a nice Grubner basis argument using a lexiographic term order. So suppose we have a Grubner basis, G1 up to a GT is a lexicographic Grubner basis for the ideal we're interested in with respect to the variable ordering, X1 is the biggest, and then Xn is the cheapest. Let's look at the Scrubner basis, so the ith element Gi. I'm gonna think about it as a polynomial in uh, the first n plus one variables whose coefficients are polynomials in the Xn. So I'm gonna write this as Ci of Xn x to the Ai plus lower order terms, so L-O-T is a lower order terms. So I'm focusing on the leading term, x to the A-I, where A-I um, is an integer vector, non-negative integer vector of length n minus one, okay? So I'm focusing on the highest term in the lexiographic order, now restricted to the first n minus one variables, okay? So let's choose, we can certainly choose a scalar in our infinite field K such that Ci is a non-root, so A is a non-root of Ci for every I, right? So uh, over an infinite field, you can find uh, lots of hay in the haystack, you can always find a non-root of a polynomial and you can find a non-root of T polynomial, so let's pick a non-root. So CI, the n is different from zero. Right? Uh, from the so CI, exactly, so CI will be different from zero, so I, uh, why is that? Wait, and CI uh, evaluated in A is different from zero, right? It's a it's number, it's not an empty set. Uh, I'm sorry, it's different from zero. Yes, it's different from zero, exactly. So this could be a constant, so if it were one, then it would be also different from zero, but if it's non-zero, we could find a non-root. Exactly, it's different from zero. Thank you very much. So now, let's look at the following polynomials. So the polynomials gi bar, which is gi x1 up to x n minus one, substitute a in, they form a Grubner basis, for the specialized ideal, so i where xn is set to ai with leading monomials. X to the ai. So this you need to check, that's a property of the lexiographic monomial ordering. So if you have a bunch of polynomials and you look at the cheapest variable in uh, look at the, uh, the cheapest variable in, uh, in the ordering you're using, you can safely specialize the cheapest variable to a scalar and the leading terms will not change as far as the other n minus one variables are concerned and the Grubner basis property will be preserved. So that's a lemma about lexiographic Grubner basis. So lexiographic Grubner basis are stable under specializing the last variable, the cheapest variable to a scalar. Now that does the trick, so I claim that none of the x to the ai, so remember these are monomials in n minus one variables, is one, right? Or suppose one of these were one, right? So then the leading term, the, what we see here, is just the polynomial in xn alone, right? Again, by the property of the lexiographic term order, the higher variables are so expensive, they can never turn, they can never appear in the lower order terms, right? So by the property of the lexiographic term order, lexiographic means the expensive variables are so expensive, they take the cake, they always win, 
right? So therefore, if none of these ex horribly expensive variables appear here in this expression, they can certainly not appear in the lower expression, okay? So therefore, none of those x to the ai is one. So therefore, we can now conclude that one is not in the specialized ideal, and now we're done as before. And let's think about for a moment, so this should complete the proof. So, uh, so this proves the claim. So under both cases, case one and case two, we've shown the claim that our ideal will have a specialization such that one is not in the ideal. So therefore, by applying the induction hypothesis, this ideal in one fewer variables has to have a root. So this is a, an ideal in one fewer variables. Then we just tag on the last coordinate, and that's a root of the original ideal. Okay, so we made by induction a root of this ideal. Okay, so this was the most technical part of today's lecture. I just wanted to give you, you know, one proof. So this is the certificate for infeasibility, um, or equivalently, if we have a proper ideal, if we have a proper ideal, then a proper ideal always has a root. So let's phrase this as a certificate, so a corollary two says a collection of polynomials so we have a collection of polynomials f1 up to fr in some polynomial ring and a bunch of variables either has a common zero in n-dimensional space, or there exists a certificate that there's no solution. There exists a certificate of non-solvability, and this certificate is a partition of unity, so it's a polynomial linear combination um, G1, F1, G2, F2, and so on, that multiplies out to one, where the multipliers are also polynomials. Okay? So clearly they're not both possible at the same time, right? So if I have a, a linear combination of the given equations that's one, then there cannot be a common root, right? Because if there were, a common root, I could substitute, so if the f's had a common root, I could substitute that common root into the f's, then the left-hand side would be the scalar zero, and the right-hand side is the scalar one. So certainly, not, it's not possible for both of them to happen at the same time, but the theorem implies that one or the other holds, right? So if, um, so if, so either there's a common zero, if there's not a common zero, then, uh, and in this theorem, V of I is the empty set, then we can conclude that I is the whole ring, and so one is in the ideal, so that is one is a polynomial linear combination of the generators. Now that's nice, right? So either there is a root, or there is an obvious certificate um, that shows that there's not a root, but how to find such a certificate? How to find such a witness? So suppose a system of equations has no root, how can you find the proof? You would like to convince your friend or your adversary that his or her system does not have a solution, so how do you find that witness that will convince that person? Well, there are two approaches. So method one is to use the extended Buchberger algorithm. So if you apply the Buchberger algorithm to the input polynomials f1, f2, up to fr, well, if there's no root, then the reduced, unique, reduced Gröbner basis 
with respect to the term order chosen by you will be the singleton one. So you'll see one as the output of your Bruckner basis computation. The extended Buchberger algorithm, just like the extended Euclidean algorithm, keeps track of what you're doing. So when you run the extended Buchberger algorithm, you keep track of the multipliers along the algorithm, and then you get one written as a linear combination of the input polynomials. So the extended Buchberger algorithm will be able to find such a certificate. The disadvantage is you have relatively little control, you know, what happens, so a second method, and one that will be also very useful later when we talk about real numbers, so method two, is you guess degree bounds. Huh? Suppose somebody promises to you that the multipliers, g1 up to gr, have at most a certain degree, or that maybe these products have at most certain degrees. So let's say the given input equations have degree two and three, and somebody promises you that this certificate on the left-hand side, you only have to use terms of degree at most 10. Okay, so let's say somebody promises this to you, and you believe that person. Well, then this becomes a linear algebra problem in a finite dimensional vector space, right? So as soon as you have degree bounds, then this becomes a linear algebra problem, right? Because then you can assume that G1 up to GR are polynomials of degree at most something, of degree at most 10. Then G1 is an element in the finite dimensional vector space spanned by monomials of degree at most 10. Well, then you multiply out the left-hand side, that's a linear combination of the unknown coefficients, right? You make an ansatz for g1, g2, and so on with unknown coefficients, and this translates into a linear, big, but finite, linear system of equations in the unknown coefficients, and you solve it, right? So that's another way to think about it. And in some sense, the extended Buchberger algorithm solves this linear system of equations. This is one particular way of solving this linear system of equations. But in order to apply this, you have to sort of have a guess what degrees you would like to have. Okay, so here's some information about degree bounds. Okay, any questions? Yes. Is there a non bound? Yes, so there is something called the effective Nullstellensatz that lets you write down an a priori bound in terms of the number of variables and the degree of the input. Uh, why can you be sure, in the proof for n equals one, why can you be sure that you can write the, um, the ideal as generated by one? Because we're in a polynomial ring in one variable. So in this stage, xn is a single variable, and so, in a pr so in a, if we're in one variable, the polynomial ring is a principal ideal ring, so every ideal is generated by one polynomial. Okay, so here we're using the fact that in one variable we have the Euclidean algorithm and Chinese remaindering. So there are other formulations of the Nullstellensatz, and uh, another formulation involves the property of being radical, so radical ideals. Our next topic is being radical. <clears throat> So recall that if we have an ideal in a ring or a polynomial ring, the radical is the set of all ring elements, so set of all polynomials in our setting, such that some power is in the ideal, well, for some non-negative integer. So if i is an ideal, you can make a larger ideal by allowing all polynomials f, a power of which is in the given ideal. That enlarges the ideal, typically. And... Sorry, when you specialize the cheapest variable, the property that the Grodner basis is, re is reused uh, is also preserved. I believe the answer is yes. Because I guess if, if after special specialization you can divide mm -hmm. by the normal sum, not the I think so. I, yes. So I believe the answer is yes. So the Grobner basis property is preserved. I believe the reduced property is also preserved. Uh, well, we certainly don't need reduced here. I don't yeah. see why either. But uh, anybody have a suggestion? So. Okay. 
So we're assuming, well, of course, we have to assume that this elimination ideal, that there's no polynomial in the cheapest variable in the ideal, right? So, so then you focus, yeah. So, so I'm not completely sure. I believe it's true, but uh, let's think about it. So we didn't need it. We didn't need it. All we needed is the Grubner mess property. Okay, so how do you compute radicals? Well, so example three, so how to compute, or exercise three, how to compute this when I is generated by monomials. So that's the simplest case, right? So if you have a, an ideal generated by monomials like x squared, y cubed, and so on, then computing the radical is the obvious thing to do, right? If x squared, y cubed is in the ideal, then certainly x times y is in the radical, right? Because the cube of x times y is in the ideal, therefore x times y is in the radical. So if you see, you know, powers appearing, you can safely erase them uh, when passing to the radical. And the answer to this exercise is for monomials, that's all you do. So if you have a list of monomials that generate an ideal, you just erase the exponents that you see and that makes the radical. So today in the afternoon at 1.30, we're gonna talk about uh, exercises both from last week on linear space and Grassmannians and from today's talk. <laughs> so uh, that's exercise three. Here's an example. So exercise three followed by example four. So let's look at a non-monomial ideal, x1, x3, x1, x4, plus x2, x3, x2, x4, okay? So this is not a monomial because I have this little plus here, so n equals four variables. That's an interesting example, and I claim this example looks radical, but in fact is not radical. So it looks radical based on uh, the previous exercise, but this is actually not a radical ideal, let me convince you, because x1, x4 is not in the ideal. So you can check. So this is generated by homogeneous quadratic polynomials. If x1, x4, also a quadric, were in the ideal, it would have to be a linear combination Q linear combination of the three generator, which it's not. So x1, x4 is not in the ideal, but the square of x1, x4 is in the ideal. Right? So x1, x4, if you square it, it lands in the ideal, right? Because if you look at x1, x4 times itself, well, it's certainly congruent mod the second relation, x1, x4 squared, is congruent up to sine to x1, x2, x3, x4. But that, you know, is in the ideal. Right? So, so you can see that the square of x1, x4 is in the ideal, x1, x4 is not in the ideal, so therefore this is not radical. But the radical can be computed. So the radical of i is the ideal generated by all monomials that you see. So x1, x3, we know that x1, x4 is in, so therefore x2, x3 has to be in, and then x2, x4 has to be in. And we also know from the very first lecture that being radical is equivalent to being intersection of prime ideals. So we can write this as an intersection of prime ideals, x1, x2, intersected x3, x4. Okay. That's a little example of something that's not radical, but the radical turns out to be a nice radical monomial ideal. <clears throat> okay, so let's get back to the Nullstellensatz. This is theorem five. This is Hilbert's Nullstellensatz. So the Nullstellensatz was first proved by David Hilbert in 1890. He had just become professor in Göttingen. 
And the purpose he did this, in this paper, wonderful paper from 1890, he laid the foundation for modern commutative algebra. And the purpose of doing that was to prove a finiteness theorem in invariant theory. So in, in about a month, there will be one lecture here on invariant theory. Invariant theory was the hottest topic of math in the 19th century, but it was really transformed by Hilbert's work at the end of the 19th century. So to understand, it's always a very, very good idea to understand mathematics to go back to the roots. The German speakers among you are blessed because you can read the original sources in German. So I urge you to read Hilbert in German, or you can read one of the Leipzig authors, Sophus Lee, Felix Klein, Chow, everything written in German. And anyway, Hilbert wrote this in 1890, and let's phrase it like this. So for every ideal in a polynomial ring, so for all ideals, if you look at the vanishing ideal of the variety of i, then that's equal to the radical of i, okay? So the radical of i has the following geometric meaning. You start with a system of polynomial equations. You look at the solutions to those polynomial equations. That's the variety. And then you ask, what are all the equations that vanish on this solution set, right? That's another ideal. So squiggly i of anything is an ideal, is a radical ideal, and that radical is the radical of i. Okay? So this characterizes polynomials that vanish on the solution set of a Gisden system of polynomials. Let's prove this. <clears throat> Sketch the proof. So the fact that the left-hand side contains the right-hand side, I claim, is easy, right? So so if you are a polynomial that's in the radical, well, that's simply the fact that uh, if a power of a polynomial vanishes somewhere, then that polynomial vanishes there, right? So if uh, f to the 10 vanishes on some set, then f vanishes on the set, and that shows that if you're in the radical, then, you know, you must vanish on the variety. So it's the, con it's the other inclusion that's the non-trivial part, so let's prove that the left-hand side is contained in the right-hand side. So let me write i as generated by f1 up to fr. Ideals are finally generated by the basis theorem. So i is generated by r polynomials. And let's assume that f is some other polynomial that vanishes on the variety of i. So I have a system of polynomials f1 up to fr, I look at its zeros, and then a new polynomial f comes in that vanishes at those zeros, and I have to convince you that some power of f is a polynomial linear combination of f1 up to fr. Okay? That's what we're claiming, that f is in the radical of i, so some power of f is in i. Okay, so here's the trick. Let's introduce a new variable y be a new variable. So now we have n old variables, x1 up to xn, and one auxiliary new variable y. Let y be a new variable. And let's look at the ideal j, which is generated by the old generators, f1 up to fr, plus one additional sneaky polynomial, which is y times f minus 1. So f is a polynomial in the axis. I multiply it by the new variable y minus 1. So this takes place in the larger polynomial ring in n plus 1 variables, x1 up to xn and a y. Okay, so that's an ideal j. Okay. Now I claim that the variety of j is the empty set, right? So in n plus 1 dimensional space, I've created a system of r plus 1 polynomials in n plus 1 unknowns that doesn't have a solution. Well, why is that? Well, the hypothesis says that if I have some point at which these guys vanish, then f doesn't vanish, right? Uh, I'm sorry, then also f vanishes. But then, you know, at any point where these guys vanish, f also vanishes, so this expression doesn't vanish, right? Because, the, because of the minus 1. 
On the other hand, right, if these don't vanish, well, that's certainly not in the variety, right? So there is no point in n plus one dimensional space where these r plus one polynomials vanish, so the variety is empty. Now, by the previous theorem, by the first version of the Nullstellensatz, theorem one, from a couple minutes ago, we know that there is a certificate, g1 up to gr. So there are multipliers, g1, gr, and h in the polynomial ring in n plus one variables, which certify the infeasibility of this system of equations. So, so this certificate takes the form, the sum i from one up to r, gi, so these multipliers may use all the variables, then we have the f's, and then finally this extra polynomial, so there's another multiplier h, which can also involve the, the y, and then y times f minus one, and the whole thing is one. Right? So we know that there exists a partition of unity certificate that shows there's no solution. So now we're gonna transform this into a proof of f being in the radical. <clears throat> okay, so the way we do that is we're gonna substitute y equals the reciprocal of f. So now we're gonna pass to the field of fractions. So we have a polynomial ring, and now we're gonna pass to the field of fractions, and in this field of fractions, we're gonna substitute y to be this thing, and then we get the following equation. So we get the equation i from one up to r, so we're gonna substitute this in here. So this is, uh, the multiplier g i x, then one over f goes here, and then f i, and that's one, right? Because this expression goes away, right? So we're gonna replace this y by the reciprocal of f, so therefore this parenthesis becomes zero, so the right-hand term becomes zero, so we have this identity in the rational function field in n variables, x1 up to xn. Well, now we do the obvious, we uh, clear denominators. So we clear denominators <coughs> to get the following expression. So there'll be expression i from one up to r, pi, some new multipliers, fi, right? So so here we clear denominator, so some power of f will be in the denominator here, and after clearing denominators, we then have f to some power, and that's exactly what we wanted to prove, right? This shows that a power of f is a polynomial linear combination of f1 up to fr, that is to say f is in the radical of the ideal i. So that's Hilbert's Nullstellensatz. So Hilbert's Nullstellensatz geometrically characterizes the radical as those polynomials that vanish on the variety. Okay. Now, an exercise is how to test membership in the radical. So uh, to test your understanding of this argument, you can now how to test Check how to test radical membership using Grobner bases. Okay, well, I'll give you a hint. So it turns out, so we use the fact that the ideal J is the trivial ideal, and from this fact that J is the ideal, is the whole ring, that I is in here we derived that f is in the radical. And it turns out that that's an if and only if. So, so the algorithm, one algorithm is to simply look at this auxiliary ideal and ask the question whether one is in this ideal. So I claim one is in the ideal if and only if f is in the radical of the ideal generated by f1 up to fr. Um, there are lots of nice examples. 
They're instructive. So linear algebra is a wonderful source of examples for nonlinear algebra, right? So if you study nonlinear algebra, you assume to have a solid understanding of linear algebra, but linear algebra also furnishes you with great examples. So I'll give you one example. So suppose you have an n by n matrix of unknowns. And you look at the ideal generated by the entries of the nth matrix power. Right? So you have uh, an n by n matrix, so they're n squared, you're in a polynomial ring, and n squared variables. And inside this ideal, inside this polynomial ring, you look at the ideal generated by n squared polynomials of degree n, namely the entries of the nth matrix power. Is this clear? Right? So you have a an unknown indeterminate matrix, you raise it to the nth power, you see a whole bunch of polynomials of degree n in those n squared variables. They generate an ideal. Then you can ask, what's the radical? Right? So, well, what's the variety? Right? So, so the variety of this are the nilpotent matrices. Right? So if you think back in your linear algebra study, right? so a nilpotent matrix is a square matrix, some power of which is the zero matrix. But by the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, if some power of a square matrix, an n by n matrix is zero, then the nth power already must be zero, right? So the variety is exactly the variety of nilpotent matrices. So then membership here means what, you know, what kind of polynomials vanish here? Well, an interesting linear polynomial is the trace, right? So if you have a nilpotent matrix and the eigenvalues are zero, so the trace is zero, right? So here you have a, a nice example of a cause radical, right? So you have this complicated ideal generated by very, very high degree polynomials, but by knowledge of linear algebra and the Nordstellensatz, you can conclude that the trace is in the radical. That is to say, some power of the trace will be a polynomial linear combination of the entries of the nth power. Here's another corollary to the Nullstellensatz, corollary seven. So if we take the function, the map, that takes a variety and maps it to its ideal. This defines a bijection between varieties. So if you look at any variety, so then you map it to the ideal in k to the n and radical ideals in the polynomial ring. Maybe we'll write the inverse down here, so we'll continue. So this is a bijection, and this bijection has an inverse map. So the inverse map takes that takes radical ideals <coughs> to varieties is the obvious one. This is given by I radical ideal goes to its variety. Right? So let's look at the uh, theorem. I guess it's here, right? So this identifies, so we have a map that says uh, if I have a variety and I look at the vanishing ideal, I get a radical ideal, but then, you know, by this notion turns out that's a bijection. You go back and forth between radical ideals and varieties in K to the N, and K is an algebraically closed field. Now among the varieties we like best, are the irreducible varieties. So under this bijection, this restricts <clears throat> to a bijection between irreducible varieties
in k to the n. So an irreducible variety is a variety that cannot be written as the union of two proper subvarieties. So every variety is uniquely a union of finitely many irreducible varieties. And algebraically, this corresponds to uh, prime ideals. And being a radical ideal means being an intersection of prime ideals. Okay? So radical ideals are in bijection with varieties. And among these, prime ideals are in bijection with irreducible varieties. Exercise 12 is what is the effect of Nullstellensatz? So sometimes these exercises are simply a matter of looking up on the internet. Right? So somebody asked, is there a global degree bound? The answer is yes, there is a global degree bound. And that goes under the header of the effect of Nullstellensatz. So the effect of Nullstellensatz says if you have a bunch of polynomials of degree at most something and n variables, then in the Nullstellensatz certificate, the multipliers have degree at most something, where the second something is an explicit expression in terms of n and the first something. Today, I'm going to take the break a little bit earlier, but I'm going to tell you what happens after the break. Okay? Are there any questions? So this is all I want to say about the usual Nullstellensatz due to David Hilbert over an algebraic closed field. Okay, now let's get real, okay? So, get real. Now that's all pretty nice, right? But in the applications that some of you will be interested in, so as you transition from linear algebra and numerical linear algebra to numerical non-linear algebra, and as you explore applications, it's typically not the complex numbers that matter. It's not typically that an algebraically closed field that matters. What matters is the real numbers, okay? And I see some nodding. So what can we say about the real numbers? So, well, first, the first news is not so good, right? So I claim that the Nullstellensatz, as stated, is not true. Right? So the Nullstellensatz, the way we phrased it in the various forms here, does not hold. if k is the field of real numbers, or in fact, any ordered field. Okay, so if k is the field of real numbers, well, r is not algebraically closed, right? The equation x squared plus one has no root, and uh, that's the source of the trouble, right? So let's look at two examples in n equals two variables. So for example, let's look at the ideal generated by x squared plus y squared plus one, right? Well, that's a perfectly good non-trivial principal ideal, right? So this ideal certainly doesn't contain one. It is a Grobner basis, as is with respect to any term order. Every singleton, every polynomial, all by him or herself, is a Grobner basis for any term order. And then one doesn't reduce to zero, so one is not in this ideal. On the other hand, it has no roots, right? So over the field of real numbers, the variety is empty, right? So over the field of complex numbers, there's a perfectly good curve in the plane. In fact, over the complex, it doesn't matter whether you put plus or minus, right? If you put minus, you get a nice quadratic curve called the circle that has lots of points. But with the plus, it also has lots of points, right? They're in fact, isomorphic over the complex numbers, but they're different over the real numbers, right? So the Nullstellensatz in the first formulation does not hold over the real numbers. And secondly, let's do another example. Let's look at x squared plus y squared. Well, that's a, an interesting ideal. That's a radical ideal. You can check that this is a radical ideal. It does have zeros, but uh, if you look at the ideal of the real variety, it gets larger, right? The ideal of the real variety is the ideal generated by x and y. Let's put this up and discuss this, right? So, so over the complex numbers, we have that the radical is the set of all polynomials that vanish on the zeros of the given polynomials. 
But here, that's not true, right? Over the real numbers, there are more polynomials that also vanish on the zeros, right? Because this equation over the real numbers has only one zero, namely the origin, zero comma zero. Well, the origin, you know, has this prime, it's an irreducible variety, is that this prime ideal, for example, the function x vanishes, but it's not in the ideal, right? So x is not in the ideal. So both formulations of the Nullstern that fail over the, over the real numbers, and after a five-minute break, break, I'll tell you what we can do about it. Okay, so in what follows, we will work over the field of real numbers, and we'll try to ask these questions. So how to certify that a real variety is empty, right? So over the complex numbers, that was a problem solvable by linear algebra. We just ask whether one is a linear combination of the generators of the ideal, how do you do this over the real numbers? Likewise, the second version, suppose we're interested in the ideal of the real variety, right? So we have a system of real equations, we look at the real zeros, and then we say, what are the polynomials that vanish on the real zeros? Okay, so those are the two questions I'd like to address. Now the idea we've already seen in my little example. So polynomial over the real numbers, is non-negative, and by this I mean it's non-negative, so if it's an n variable, it's on, at every point in R to the n. Well, it's non-negative if it is a sum of squares. Of polynomials, right? So a key fact over the real numbers, it's an ordered field, and the order ties in with the arithmetic of the field, right? If you take a, a square of a real number, you get a non-negative real number. If you add squares of real numbers, you get a non-negative real number. In particular, if you have a polynomial that's a sum of squares of other polynomials, that polynomial will be globally non-negative on R to the n. So that's an idea we like to exploit. Now Minkowski, asked the question in 1885, does the converse hold? Does the converse hold? Is it true that if you have a non-negative polynomial, a polynomial that takes only non-negative values, can you represent it always as a sum of squares of non-negative polynomials? And that was also answered by Hilbert in uh, 1893, and the answer is no. So Hilbert argued that there are polynomials uh, that are non-negative, that are not sums of squares of, uh, of polynomials. Now, in his famous list of uh, open problems in 1900 at the Mathematical Congress in Paris, one of the problems, the 17th, was it the 17th, I forgot, he asked how about sum of squares of rational functions. Okay, so the answer is no if for the question whether your polynomial is a sum of squares of polynomials, but at that time he did not know whether it uh, might be in the non-negative case a sum of squares of rational functions. So, to understand the difference, let's look at the uh, following example. <clears throat> this is example 10. So I'm going to give you a rational function in two variables, x squared plus y squared plus 1 times x squared y squared times x squared plus y squared minus 2 and the whole thing squared and a little bit more in the numerator, namely x squared minus y squared and the whole thing squared. So that's uh, the numerator. Now notice this numerator is a sum of squares, right? So this is a, uh, a sum of squares of two polynomials, right? So the left thing is uh, everything is squared, so the left thing is a square of a polynomial plus another square of a polynomial, okay? Now well, let's divide the whole thing by x squared plus y squared, squared, right? 
That's also a square. So this thing is a sum of squares of rational functions. Right? So if I break the numerator as the first sum end divided by the denominator, that's a square of a rational function plus another square of a rational function. Okay, that's a sum of two squares of rational functions. But it turns out that this thing is actually a polynomial, right? So this divides and this becomes x to the fourth plus y squared times y squared plus x squared y to the fourth plus one minus three x squared y squared, okay? So let me call this m of x. And this is a polynomial that has a name. That's the so-called Motzkin polynomial, okay? Well, you can check this, right? So you type this thing into your favorite computer algebra system. You say factor, and out comes the right thing, right thing, okay? So this is an identity of rational functions, and it's an identity for any real numbers, x and y, not both zero, right? Okay, well, that's a polynomial. So that polynomial visibly is non-negative, right? So every point other than the origin, this representation shows it's non-negative. At the origin, it's one. So that's a non-negative polynomial. And we have a, a certificate according to the 1900 question of Hilbert. Now I claim that this polynomial, this Motzkin polynomial, is not a sum of squares of polynomials, is not a sum of squares of polynomials. So I have exhibited to you as a sum of squares of rational functions, but I claim it's not a sum of squares of polynomials. Well, yes. Um, you forgot the not. Is. Not. Is not. Thank you. Not, not a sum of squares of, of polynomials, okay? Now, this part of the lecture, so the main source that I'd like to advertise is this book. So it's called Positive Polynomials and Sum of Squares by Murray Marshall. Okay, so for further reading, this is a, a very good book. Um, let's see why that's true. Okay, well, by contradiction, so if it were, if it were a sum of squares of polynomials, well, let's assume it were, right, then this polynomial M would be a sum of a bunch of terms, each term of which is alpha i x squared y plus beta i x y plus gamma i x y plus delta i and the whole thing squared, right? Well, think about the support. So if you have a square of some polynomial, what that means, the monomials are basically in the convex hull of twice the Newton polygon, right? So you think for a moment, but right, if this were, you know, you look at these terms, right? So the exponent vectors are 4, 2, 2, 4, 0, 0, 2, 2, right? You plot these points in the plane, then if this thing were a sum of squares, then every polynomial inside of these squares would have to be half, inside half, of the triangle, right? So the triangle, half triangle has vertices two, one, one, two, and zero, zero. One, one is in the interior, and that's what we're saying here. These are the only possible terms that could possibly appear in the sum of squares representation. And I'm missing a square here. Now we're good, okay? For some real numbers. Okay, so for some alpha i, beta i, gamma i, delta i, real numbers, and we don't know how many terms there are, but a finite number, right? So there will be a finite number of these things. So, uh, okay, now the coefficient, I claim. Let's look at the coefficient of x squared, y squared in the right-hand side, right? So let's look at this. Well, the only way you can get an x squared, y squared, right, if you square something, right, then there might be several ways of getting, you know, maybe an x squared, y squared, but the way this is organized here, the only way you can get x squared, y squared is by squaring this term, right? You cannot, right, so you cannot, like, this one against this one or somebody, right, so there are 10 possibilities, right? So there are, you know, these four things, and then you pick, 
you know, two of them possibly with repetition that could possibly give x squared y squared, but nine of these combinations are bad. They won't do it. The only possibility is you pair this guy with itself. That's the only way you can get x squared y squared. So therefore, the coefficient equals the sum, however many terms, of gamma i squared. Now this real number, whatever it is, is a non-negative real number. On the other hand, on the left-hand side, it's negative 3. Negative 3 is not a non-negative real number, so this completes the group proof, okay? So by looking at the monomials that can occur, we see that this is not a sum of squares of polynomials, but I've exhibited to you as a sum of squares of rational functions. Now, Arten showed that this always works. So this is Arten's theorem. Let's state this here. <clears throat> So Arten answered Hilbert's question. So Arten's theorem, this is Emil Arten from Hamburg, 1927, father of Mike Arten, celebrated non-commutative algebraist. So uh, Arten's theorem from 1927 answers Hilbert's question. It says that f, if f is a polynomial, with real coefficients and n variables that is non-negative, on Rn, then there exist polynomials P1 up to PR and Q1 up to QR, all polynomials in the same ring with the property that f as a rational function is p1 over q1 squared plus p2 over p2 squared, blah, blah, pr over qr squared. Okay. So Arten shows that every polynomial that's non-negative on r to the n has a representation um, as a sum of squares of rational functions just like the Motzkin polynomial down there, okay? Now, equipped with this, we can now formulate the real Nullstellensatz. So this is the Nullstellensatz over the real numbers. So, so our formulation in the notes is theorem 11. So let I be an ideal <clears throat> in a polynomial ring in n variables with real coefficients whose variety is empty. And now I mean the real variety. Whose real variety, Vr of I, is empty. Then I claim, without fail, there will be a certificate for this, a witness. And now the witness takes the following form. Then I claim that minus 1 is a sum of square, a sum of squares of polynomials mod the ideal. Polynomials modulo the ideal i i.e., that is to say, there exist polynomials P1 up to PR that cook up the sum of squares so that 1 plus P1 squared plus plus PR squared is in the ideal. Okay? That's a certificate. Okay? So that's equivalent, so you bring, you know, one on the other side, and this says that minus one equals a sum of squares modulo the ideal. That's equivalent, so, so let's think again um, why that's a certificate. Well, suppose you have a real system of equations, I, and you want to convince somebody that there's no real solution, right? So then what you do is you write, you cook up some polynomial, somehow, P1 up to PR, and you write one plus the sum of square as a linear combination of the given polynomials. Now, if there were a solution, right, then 
you know, here we get zero, but here this is strictly positive, right? So that can't be, okay? So this is an obvious certificate for no solution, and this theorem says that this always exists. So proof, I like to refer you to Marshall's book. So this is section 2.3 on Murray Marshall's book on positive polynomials and sum of squares. So theorem nine, that's Artin's theorem. So, so Artin's theorem over there, that's theorem nine in the notes, can be derived from this more general formulation. So I claim that theorem 11 is stronger than Artin's theorem. So let me give you the idea. So the idea of this derivation is, so assuming that this theorem is true, so we'd like to show that uh, a non-negative polynomial is always a sum of squares of rational functions. So I'm given a polynomial f that's non-negative on r to the n, and I like to write it as a sum of squares of rational functions by way of this representation. So here's what I do. I use the same trick as before. But what I'm gonna do now, I introduce an auxiliary variable y again. But now I'm gonna look at f times y squared plus one. So earlier we had f times y minus one, but now let me look at f times y squared minus one. I always have to play with squares over the real numbers. Well, since f is assumed to be a non-negative polynomial, the real variety of g is empty, right? And this is inside real n plus one dimensional space, right? So it's similar to the argument we had for the ordinary knowledge turns out. So, so I'm assuming that f is a non-negative polynomial. I multiply it by a new variable y squared, that's non-negative, plus one, and so this has no solutions, right? This has no roots if, if g is non-negative. Well, by theorem 11, so I wanted to derive Artin from theorem 11. By theorem 11, there exists a certificate now. There exists an identity, identity, of the form one plus p1 x y squared plus blah, blah, up to a PR xy squared, and then plus h xy times g xy, and that's equal to zero, right? So, so this last term is simply an arbitrary element in the ideal, right? So I have the, uh, the pr I'm applying this to the principal ideal generated by g, right? So the principal ideal generated by g has no zeros, and this just says that one plus the sum of squares in the ideal. So plus something in the ideal is equal to zero, okay? So now you have to do something similar. Now you substitute y as one over the square root of minus f of x. You have to be a little bit careful in the notes, or we have to fix the notes, right? So this has a plus square root and a minus square root, right? So you first substitute in with the plus square root, and you substitute in with the minus square root, and you multiply the two things to get rid of the square roots, then you have a rational function, so, so then, you know, you clear denominators, and so on. Okay. ETC, okay? So the idea is very similar, except now the role that the y played earlier is played by the y squared. Okay. So this is a version of the real Nullstellensatz. Now, so the Nullstellensatz over the real number says no root, then minus one is a sum of squares mod the ideal, mod the, uh, the equations. Now let's answer the second question. What can we say about the polynomials that vanish on the real solutions of some polynomials? This will be called the real radical. Okay, so let me define this. So given any ideal, I 
over the field of real numbers in n variables. I'm now going to take the geometric definition of the radical. I'm going to say the real radical, I'm going to use the ge geometric characterization as the definition, so is the ideal. <clears throat> I'm going to write the real radical of i. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you the syntactic definition and then I'm going to state the theorem. So the real radical is the following. It's a set of all polynomials with real coefficients such that some even power f to the 2m plus g1 squared plus plus g s squared is in the ideal. Well, for some non-negative integer n and some polynomials g1 up to gs in the polynomial ring. Okay. So let's, let's digest this, okay? So you have an ideal, okay? Now I'm telling you, I'm giving you a larger ideal, okay? I'm gonna give you an enlarged ideal. I'm gonna take all polynomials F with the property that some even power of that polynomial plus some arbitrary sum of squares is in the ideal. Okay? Now there are a couple things to be shown. Well, first of all, this is an ideal. Right? So I claim this is, this is a set of polynomials. Well, first of all, you know, this set of polynomials is an ideal and it's in fact a radical ideal. Okay, so to show that it's an ideal, well, you have to show that the sum of two things, you know, is in there again. If you have something in there, you multiply it by a polynomial, it's still in there. Okay? So these things need to be checked. And it's in fact a radical ideal. Okay? And I call this thing the real radical. And this is the one that does the trick. So this is theorem 14. <coughs> so theorem 14, this would be the real analog of the uh, Hilbert's Nullstellensatz, Nullstellensatz, that says that the ideal of the real variety is equal to exactly this thing. Okay, so the real radical is given by this formulation. Okay. So it does the trick. So while you digest the statement, I'm going to erase one side of the board. <clears throat> First of all, we have uh, the corollary, right? So formally, we have the same corollary as before. So we get a bijection. Between Real varieties, so sub-varieties in R to the N. And real radical ideals in the polynomial ring. So it's not so easy, or it's actually not so easy to check whether an ideal is radical to begin with, right? But there's code. Right? So in Mac Macaulay 2 or Sage or your favorite computer algebra system, you type in, you know, your equations, you say radical. And often it works, right? Now how does it work? Well, that's not so clear. It's a little bit like driving a car, right? You drive a car, it's amazing. Cars drive. And some of the more engineering-oriented people wonder, how does the car actually work? Right? So, but, so some of you might be curious about how does the car, but most of us would just get into the car and we drive, and it's amazing, right? Same with the radical command in Macaulay too, right? So somebody implemented some algorithm that always finds the radical. And some of us, if you're more engineering-oriented, you might like to go in there, right? How does, you know, the logarithm button work on your calculator, right? It's not the same as looking up the table in the logarithm table when I was young, you know? So, okay, with a real radical, well, how do you compute it? Okay, so that's one question. 
But let's do an example first. So let's go back to the Motzkin polynomial. So this is example 15. So reminder, that's x to the fourth y squared plus x squared y to the fourth plus one minus three x squared y squared. So that's the Motzkin polynomial. And let's look at the principal ideal generated by this. So we're in the real polynomial ring in two variables, x and y, and we'll look at the principal ideal generated by m. And I'm gonna be interested in computing the real radical, okay? So I'm gonna give away the answer, but I'm gonna show you a couple steps along the way. So let's do the following. Let's use j to be the numerator ideal. of the SOS representation. Right? So I magically pulled out, out of the hat, a sum of squares of rational function representation of this M. Never mind how I found it, but I gave it to you 20 minutes ago. So certainly the two terms whose sum of squares I'm taking in the numerator must be in the real radical. Right? So, so certainly, so in the left term I had x, y, times x squared plus y squared minus two. I took a square of that. And the other thing was x squared minus y squared. And obviously they vanish on the real variety, right? Think about it for a moment, right? You have the sum of squares representation. Each term must vanish on the real variety. And then, you know, if the square of something vanishes, then the something vanishes, okay? So certainly this ideal j will be contained in the real radical. Okay, so, uh, okay, now the real radical, whatever it is, is gonna be a radical ideal. So I might as well calculate the radical. So using the algorithm that's implemented, right, like driving a car, now we drive the car over this, we calculate the ordinary radical, certainly that will be contained in the real radical. So, so I claim the ordinary radical in this case will be equal to the Jacobian ideal, so it's generated by the Motzkin polynomial and its derivatives, and it's, well, so you calculate the radical of this, and let me for convenience write it as an intersection of primes, and each of these primes actually is uh, the maximum ideal of a real point. Well, that's uh, x, plus one, y minus one, x plus one, y plus one, okay? So I claim that the, the radical of j, that certainly contained the real radical, that is a real radical ideal. And I've given it as an intersection of the maximal ideals of five points, that's real radical. So, so this proves that that's the real radical, okay? So I've, that's it, so, uh, so this ideal, we summarize the argument. So this ideal on the right-hand side is real radical, meaning it's equal to its real radical because you know each of these things is a very simple maximal ideal, the maximal ideal of a real point, so this is a real radical ideal. It contains I. And it must be contained The way we constructed it, it must be contained in the real radical of I, so therefore it's equal to the real radical of I, okay? So geometrically, what I'm saying is the Motzkin polynomial has a real variety in the real plane consisting of five points, right? So the five points are zero, zero, one, one, one minus one, minus one, one, minus one, minus one, so that's what this shows, right? So this shows that the variety of the Monotskin polynomial over the complex curve, perfectly good complex curve, but has only five real points, and these are the five points. Okay. Now to do this in general. So question, how to do this in general? Can I just yes. Why can't the radical equal the Jacobian? Um, well, I didn't tell you. That's right, but I'm gonna give away the secret. So the Jacobian is always a good thing if you have a non-negative polynomial, okay? It's always good to think about the Jacobian because every real point will be a singular point of the complex curve, okay? 
if you have an isolated real point, so if you have a complex curve, so, so the set of complex solutions to M, so if you take the variety of M over the complex numbers, that's a perfectly good curve. It's an irreducible curve. But this has five isolated real points. But I claim an isolated real point is always a singular point. You can see this in one variable, right? So if you have a curve, right, if you have a graph, well, okay, so if you have a non-negative polynomial in one variable, and if that non-negative polynomial has a real root, that real root must be a multiple root. And same in several variables, okay? So that's why throwing in the derivative is always a good thing that makes progress. In, okay? So every isolated real point uh, must be a singular point of the associated complex variety. So question, how to do this in general? The question, how to compute the real radical in general. Okay? Now, of course, that assumes that you know how to compute the radical. Right? There are two answers. Right? So there's the lazy drivers, you just say radical in Macaulay 2, or you dig in, you know, how does the car actually work? Okay? Once you understand that, then you can study how the hovercraft works or the airplane or something. Right? So the real radical is a version of the radical, just a little bit more complicated. Um, let me give you a different perspective on this. So, the last topic today is positive Stellen, Stellen, Sätze. So, Nullstellen Sätze concern points at which well, there are zeros of something, right? Now, positive Stellen Sätze make sense over an ordered field like the real number. So those are going to be, you know, theorems about positivity. So let's talk about positive Stellen Sätze. And I'm going to motivate this by linear programming. So linear programming is the mother of all optimization problems, well familiar to Diplom students in Wirtschaftsmathematik at Uni Leipzig. So everybody knows about linear programming being very, very important for optimization. So, so let's briefly talk about linear programming duality. So what's linear programming? So linear programming deals at its most basic level with systems of linear equations. Well, and inequalities. Linear equations and linear inequalities. <clears throat> and uh, so one formulation, we give you the primal formulation of a linear program. So you might ask, does there exist a real vector in R to the N that satisfies a bunch of linear equations, F1 up to FR, equals zero, and G1 is non-negative, blah, blah, up to Gs is non-negative. So this is a system of linear, inhomogeneous equations and inequalities over the real numbers, okay? So the feasibility problem in linear programming is this question, right? You have R linear equations, S linear inequalities, is there a point? The inhomogeneous inequalities, okay? That's the primal formulation. Now, there's a dual formulation, so we write the dual linear program as follows. So I'm gonna write this in a bit of a weird way, right? So in your linear programming class, you've seen the primal and the dual, strong duality holds, of course, but you might not have quite seen this formulation. I'm gonna write this a little bit differently. So, so the dual says, does there exist A1 up to AR, B1 up to BS, okay? So these are real multipliers. Are there real multipliers that certify that the primal problem has no solution? And I'm gonna say this as follows. 
So the certification says that A1, F1 plus plus, A R F R plus B1 squared, G1 plus plus, B S squared, G S is minus one. Well, this is as linear forms. I'm going to write in R of X. So I claim that this is a way of formulating linear programming duality, and precisely one of these two things will hold. So I'll try to parse this while I erase the right-hand side. Okay. So the basic theorem that you learn in your linear programming class is sometimes called Farkash lemma. It says exactly one of these two holds. Either P holds or D holds, but not both. Right? So, so either there's a primal solution, either there exists a solution to your system of linear equations or linear inequalities, or there's a certificate which is a dual solution. The dual solution says that there is a linear combination of everything, of the Fs and the Gs, where the Gs have non-negative multipliers and the linear combination makes minus one. Again, you know, that's a certificate. And that's linear programming duality. So this is just for the feasibility problem, right? So either P is feasible or D is feasible, but not both. And then there's versions, you know, that work for the optimization problem. Okay. So I don't know whether you guys are familiar, but you should be familiar with linear programming, especially if you're a diploma student in Wirtschaftsmathematik. So now let's do the same thing nonlinear. This is linear algebra. So linear programming is optimization in the context of linear algebra. This course is about nonlinear algebra. So let's take this linear algebra formulation and make it nonlinear. So now let's consider the nonlinear version. Let's consider the same situation. So let's consider the primal problem pre, but now the given constraints f i and g j are arbitrary polynomials of any degree, not just linear, but the arbitrary polynomials, quadrics, cubics, and so on, in our polynomial. Okay. So we're asking the same question. We have a system of r equations, nonlinear. And as on inequalities, nonlinear, is there a version of linear programming duality? Okay. Now let me phrase the dual as follows. The dual now takes the following form. D prime, slightly more complicated, so I'm still allowing linear combinations, A1, up to AR, FR, but the Bs are slightly more complicated. So the second term is the sum over all binary vectors in of length um, S. Sorry, so I take over all binary vectors nu of length S, so zero, one vectors of length S. Then I have a multiplier, the sum J, B, j nu squared, and now I'm going to take a square free monomial in the g's. So g to the nu 1, g1 nu 1, g2 nu 2, up to g s nu s, but the conclusion is the same. The same thing is minus 1. Okay? So it looks almost the same, except on these inequalities, the multipliers are a little bit more complicated. But where the these things, so I got my existential quantifier where the A's, the AI, and the B, J nu, these are now polynomials. Okay. So the dual says there exists a linear combination of minus one, well, where the multipliers of the F's are polynomials, and the multipliers of the G's are this, you know, slightly more complicated sums of squares. Now this thing over here is already very familiar. So every polynomial that has this representation, that's known to you. This is the ideal generated by the equations. Right? So 
Anything you can represent here, this is the ideal generated by the equational constraints, so that's very familiar to you. The stuff over here is a little bit less familiar, so this complicated thing also has a name that's called the quadratic module. It's called the quadratic module generated by the GJ. Okay? The quadratic module is a subset of the polynomial ring generated by R or S polynomials. So to be in the quadratic module, here's what you do. You have a bunch of Gs. You allow yourself to take products, but only square-free products, right? So, so if you have S of these Gs, you take all two to the S products that you can form. And then you allow yourself linear combinations with multipliers that are sums of squares, okay? So it's sums of squares, linear combinations of square-free products of the given stuff. That's called the quadratic module. Theorem is that this does the trick. So theorem, and this would be theorem 13. So this is one version of the Positivstellensatz. Well, same formulation as in linear programming, exactly one, either P or D prime holds, okay? Either the primal problem, the system of equation inequalities has a solution, or there exists a certificate. A certificate says that minus one is in the sum of something in the ideal of the equations, plus something in the quadratic module of the inequalities. Okay, that's the positive Stellsatz. And it's a direct generalization of linear programming duality. So if you unravel this in the linear case, you recover linear programming duality. Okay, so the basic convex optimization problem in linear algebra is called linear programming. Linear programming duality is central to linear programming and the algorithms for solving it. Here we have the positive Stellensatz. It's the non-linear version of linear programming duality. So here's a bunch of questions. How to use this for algorithms? Okay, I'm gonna write these questions down. Second question, are there degree bounds? And the third question, Okay, so before I come to the answers to these three questions, let me give you one more example, okay? <clears throat> so the third example is exercise six. This pertains to polynomials in n equals three variables, and that's an exercise. So you are invited this afternoon at 1.30 to discuss these problems, to also talk about linear spaces, Grassmannians, especially if you're not here, you're invited, okay? So people are always welcome. So your friends who are not currently here are herewith invited to come this afternoon at 1.30, and this is one of the exercises that's on the list. So here is an example. So I is the ideal generated by x to the fourth minus x squared, y squared, y to the fourth, minus z to the fourth. And the exercise is to determine, well, the varieties, right? But sort of a nice way to phrase this is find the radical and the real radical, right? So what are the zeros? Now we're in three-dimensional space. So this is a system of two equations in three unknowns, right? So this equation says that y to the fourth equals z to the fourth. This equation says that x to the fourth equals x squared y squared. And the question is, how can this be true? Over the complex numbers and over the real numbers. Now, just like in my Motskin example, it's always good to write this as the intersection of prime ideals, right? If you really want to be sure that something 
is a radical ideal, it's good to write it as an intersection of prime ideals. So, so here the task is to solve this system of two degree four equations in three unknowns. Okay, so that's one of the things we could do this afternoon. Well, let's get to, uh, to these three questions. So how to use this for algorithms? This is essential for algorithms. The nonlinear version of linear program is semi-definite programming. So on June 26th, the topic of the ring for liaison is semi-definite programming. The lecture notes were posted yesterday. So since yesterday, you could read the notes on semi-definite programming. Semi-definite programming has a very natural extension called sum of squares programming. So sum of squares programming is a new paradigm in convex optimization that's widely, widely, widely used, and we're gonna to get to this. So optimization is very important, nonlinear. This course is, of course, an applied math course. Well, you knew this all along, right? So nonlinear algebra, we're emphasizing the applied aspects, and uh, we're using this for algorithms. How do we use this for algorithms? Well, rather than asking whether a system has a solution, we're not asking for solutions. We're asking for certificates of infeasibility. So somebody, your engineering friends, present you with a system of equations and inequalities, and they want a solution, or the optimal solution, right? Rather than asking for the solution, you ask for a proof of infeasibility. You ask for the dual solution. Now the dual solution can then be phrased as a semi-definite program, and that can be applied very widely in this setting. So what I presented here in the second half today was sort of the, uh, the algebraic underpinnings of sum of squares programming. And I invite you, especially you who are not here, to take a look at the 26 June notes. Are there degree bounds? Well, yes, but they're horrible, okay? So the usual effective Nullstellensatz has reasonable bounds. The real Nullstellensatz and positive Stellensatz, there are bounds. They have the flavor of logic and model theory. So there is a paper that gives a bound. It's a horrible bound. It's, it's very, very, way, very far from what we believe to be true. So, so the answer is yes, there are degree bounds, but they're very bad, and there's a lot of research that still needs to be done. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Schmutken, who uh, was on the faculty here, has been on the faculty for many years at the University of Leipzig. He's kind of a hero in this subject. So if you read uh, Murray Marshall's book, there's, uh, I think, two chapters named after Schmutken's Positivstellensatz. And I think what's remarkable, and I think also important for this ring is that this is really came from analysis. So I think there was a motivation coming from function analysis to study this topic. So I thought we'll take a couple minutes to uh, invite you to uh, say a few words about the history and. Maybe if you're willing to step forward, I'll be the guy who cleans the board.